Uh, Your Holiness and uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our continuance of the discussion we started this morning. It, uh, although we're going to continue with a slightly different accent and focus, uh, this morning we uh, heard about the larger uh, philosophical world in which uh, practice occurs and what the implications are in an interface with science uh, for forming a, a community of practice in contemplative neuroscience particularly. We're now going to get, uh, hello? Yes, we're now going to get very concrete and look at a case in point of how you actually do this. How can you operationalize this? What, what kinds of hypotheses can you generate? What issues, methodological issues do you face when uh, meditation comes into the laboratory? So uh, let me quickly uh, introduce the <coughs> panel. Uh, to my far right is Rajesh Kastura Ragnan who heads the Cognitive Science Program at the National Institute of Advanced Studies at Bangalore. Uh, and uh, I, I met Rajesh uh, when he was um, at MIT, having finished his PhD there in, in Cognitive Science. Uh, and I believe, Your Holiness, that you, you've met everyone else on the panel. Matthew Ricard, you know well, he translates for you in France. And for those of you who have not met Matthew, he's a monk at the Session monastery in Kathmandu, and also uh, holds a PhD in cellular genetics from the Pasteur Institute. Uh, Richie Davidson uh, was in our morning panel. Wolf, Dr. Wolf Singer is the director of the Max Planck Institute for uh, Brain Research in Frankfurt and founding director of the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and Ernst Strungman Institute for Brain Research. Uh, and uh, John Dunn teaches in the Department of Religion at Emory University, is co-director of the Encyclopedia of Contemplative Practices and the Emory Collaborative for Contemplative Studies and has his PhD in the study of religion from Harvard. And uh, <coughs> we're going to start with Richie. I should tell you a story. Richie and I were graduate students together at Harvard. And uh, Richie, is, it was clear back then that he was going to have a brilliant career. He did. He, he did his PhD research and finished writing it up in six weeks flat. Just to give you a normative comparison, it took me a year and a half to do the same thing. So Richie has made a great contribution uh, in founding affective neuroscience and now going on to develop the field of contemplative neuroscience. My contribution to science was to become a journalist. <laughs> so let's start with Richie. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, wonderful to be with you again, and you're such an inspiration. Uh, we are so grateful. Uh, quite a few years ago, Your Holiness, you challenged us, and you said to us that we have used the tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities like fear and anxiety and depression, and you challenged us to apply those tools to the study of positive human qualities like kindness and compassion, equanimity. And uh, what I'd like to do in the brief time I have this afternoon uh, for the sake uh, of our panelists and also for our Indian brothers and sisters to uh, uh, give a summary of what we have learned in some of the key areas in this research program that was directly stimulated uh, by my first interaction with you uh, in 1992. Uh, and the work really began in, the, in about 1999 or 2000, and uh, it's just been accelerating since. And so I'd like to talk about four topics today. Uh, the first topic will be studies of compassion. Whoops, we can have the, uh, Studies of compassion. Uh, uh, on the brain. And uh, here we have taken advantage of the benefit of long-term practitioners that we bring to Madison uh, to uh, learn what we can about what's going on in the brain during the generation of compassion. The second... It's not, it's not on the oh. slideshow. 
to get the. Uh, oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. The, 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 uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Can hit F5. No, that's that's okay. Uh, so the second topic will be probing the nature of awareness during open presence. Uh, and uh, these are some very new findings from uh, long-term practitioners. The third topic is really honoring the work that Francisco Varela began, uh, and that is neurophenomenology, but neurophenomenology here with expert practitioners who are familiar with their minds in a way which we think uh, is beneficial from a neuroscientific perspective uh, to show what we can learn. Uh, and finally, the last topic will be on mindfulness and attention. So we'll see how much I can get through. Uh, so the first is on compassion. And here uh, we have done a, a very, very simple kind of experiment uh, with long-term practitioners where they come into the laboratory and we have them just alternate between a neutral state and a state in which compassion is generated. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about the specific nature of the compassion practice in just a moment. But one of the uh, uh, important qualities of working with experts is that they can produce the practice uh, and the state uh, in very short periods of time. And so this is beneficial from a scientific perspective because we can contrast the neutral state, and the meditation state. Now we also, uh, uh, as I'll show uh, in a moment, uh, we can evaluate what is happening when a practitioner generates compassion by challenging the mind with certain kinds of external stimuli that we present during the meditation state. And here, what we're particularly interested in is we present sounds of human suffering. For example, crying, uh, a woman screaming. So uh, these are sounds that challenge the mind and the brain and enable us to see how a mind which is infused with compassion responds differently from those stimuli compared to when the we're in a neutral state. And it's kind of like a cardiologist who is interested in measuring the heart will sometimes have you exercise on a treadmill to challenge the heart. And what we're doing is challenging the mind uh, in, a, in a certain kind of way. So in the work at Pew here, and I'm sure he'll mention this in his presentation, he said what we have tried to do for the sake of the experiment is to generate a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. And so, so our first study, uh, which uh, was authored by Antoine Lutz, as first author, you've met Antoine. Antoine was uh, Francisco's uh, last graduate student who is now uh, in our lab in Madison. Uh, and this is from a paper that was published in, in 2004. And uh, what it shows uh, in this figure is a transition from the resting state to a state of meditation. And it's usually the case that in the analysis of brain activity, we need sophisticated computer techniques to extract signals. And here we can visibly see a difference between the resting state and the meditation state uh, where there is a presence of high amplitude oscillations in a particular frequency range called gamma, which is a fast frequency uh, that has been implicated in uh, binding 
percepts together, binding different elements of a perception together. And this is some uh, uh, seminal So by binding, what we mean is that uh, often binding, binding. So uh, often, uh, an experience involves visual perception, sounds, auditory perception. Uh, uh, if we're eating, it may involve taste. And um, uh, all of these different elements come together in our experience. The coming together of these elements is referred to as binding, where these different elements are integrated. And uh, uh, one hypothesis about the significance of gamma activity, and particularly the synchronized gamma activity across different regions of the brain, is that it plays a role in bringing these different elements together. So this is Mathieu after he came out of the scanner. I showed this picture the other day. Um, he's been in the scanner many, many times. And we have used the scanner to tell us what circuits may be uh, affected by compassion meditation practice. And here there is uh, a diagram of the brain and the area that's circled is an area that is called the insula. And the insula is a very interesting part of the brain because it's the only part of the brain that actually has a map of the different visceral organs of the body. And uh, it is a system in the brain through which interaction with the body appears to occur. And what we see in response to the negative sounds that we present to the practitioners is that the, the activity in this area of the insula is dramatically enhanced during the compassion practice uh, uh, compared to a neutral state. Among novice practitioners who were taught the same practice and who practiced for one week before coming into the laboratory, there is no difference. I'd like to now uh, share with you uh, and the audience uh, findings from a very recent study uh, where we are evaluating the nature of awareness during open presence. And um, this is a particular kind of meditation practice in the Buddhist tradition. And one of the expectations that we had of this practice is that there should be um, uh, uh, if we present a stimulus to a practitioner that tells the practitioner that in 10 seconds they will receive a very painful, physically painful stimulus. And the pain that we use is heat. And we can deliver it in a very safe way. Uh, and we give each person an experience of the heat before we start so that they know exactly what it feels like. And we tell them that when they get this cue, in 10 seconds, they'll get a very, very painful stimulus. And we conjectured that during open presence, since one moment of awareness is going to have less impact on the next, so that each moment would just be, uh, uh, would be experienced 
without influence of one moment to the next, that there should be a difference in the anticipation of the pain. And so in the next slide, uh, we first show the ratings uh, of the intensity and the unpleasantness of the pain. And in the um, bars that are marked OP, that stands for open presence. And what we can see is that the unpleasantness uh, in the experts, which, who are in the red, is dramatically reduced compared to the novices who are displayed in the blue. Uh, there's relatively little difference in intensity, but there's a very large difference in unpleasantness. So we now go to the brain to see what is happening in the brain when we present a cue that indicates that a pain will be occurring in a few seconds. And so this is the way the experiment works. Uh, the practitioner begins meditation, and then the stimulus begins to get warm. And they are told that once it gets warm, in 10 seconds, it will get very, very hot and painful. And so uh, the warm stimulus occurs at time zero, and then the heat occurs uh, 10 seconds later. So the question is, what is going on in the brain as well as in the body when the practitioner gets the cue which informs him that the pain will be occurring soon? And what we see here is the period uh, during anticipation as well as during the pain itself. So uh, the, um, the red bar here is the practitioner, uh, and the blue bar are the controls, who uh, are the novices, who are just learning the practice. And uh, the period just prior to the uh, red line uh, that begins at about 10 seconds in time is when the painful heat occurs. And what we see is that in the anticipation period, before the heat occurs, the blue bar, which is the novices, begins to activate. Uh, and it shows very, very high levels of activation just when the cue is presented, even though there's no pain. So the emotional areas of the brain that are responsive to the uh, negative emotions that are associated with pain begin to show strong activation, uh, even though there's no pain at all. So this is during the period. During the pain, it Yes, they're more anxious. So it's what we would say is that it's anticipatory. But they were already informed. They were already informed that. Yes, they're the already answer. informed. And what we would say is that it's anticipatory anxiety. It's anxiety in anticipation. And it, it serves no useful function. Uh, uh, and what we see in the practitioners who are displayed in red is that when the pain actually occurs, there's a very big response but then it comes right back down to baseline. But there's very little anticipation. So, so this to so, uh, I'd like to now move on, uh, mindful of time, I'm just going to go right ahead and talk a little bit about how we have considered the project of neurophenomenology and begun to explore it in the laboratory with the expert practitioners. And the motivation for this is that expert practitioners, because they are more familiar with their own mind, their reports of their experience 
should be more closely tied to what we actually can measure in the brain compared to a novice practitioner who has spent much less time uh, contemplating the, 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 their mind, uh, the reports that we get there we wouldn't expect to be strongly associated with the brain. So that's what we tested here. So the way we did it uh, is to have practitioners report on the clarity of their experience. And they are meditating, and while they're meditating, as their clarity begins to change, they uh, uh, press a keypad to indicate the extent of their clarity on a one to nine point scale. So if their clarity is very low, <laughs> So if their clarity is low, they might rate it a one, and then it can go up the scale. And this is one uh, expert practitioner. And what this shows, Your Holiness, is um, on one scale is their report of clarity, and that's in the red line. And the blue line is the extent of these gamma oscillations that we talked about earlier. And this is showing the correspondence between their reports of clarity and the magnitude of these gamma oscillations uh, from the beginning to the end of a meditation period. And what this shows is a very close association between their reports of clarity and these gamma oscillations. And um, it, it, this is not true for just a single practitioner, but it happens in um, all of the practitioners that we have observed. So this is another practitioner at different points in time, and this is showing also very strong associations. And um, this is just a representation of nine practitioners, and what it is showing is the association, the, the strength of the correspondence between the reports of clarity and the magnitude of these gamma oscillations, which are depicted in blue, for each of the nine practitioners, and for some practitioners, we had different sessions, different days that they were meditating. And so that's depicted here. And across these eight practitioners, nine practitioners, uh, there is overall a very close association between their reports of their experience and the um, magnitude of gamma oscillations. In the novice practitioners, they are, the, the, the average correlation is zero. They're just not associated whatsoever. Uh, and so to us, uh, what this reflects is that the reports of experience from expert practitioners are remarkably more closely associated with measures of brain function that we could take uh, as the meditation practice unfolds. But the um, final topic, and, and this just shows, before I get to the final topic, this just shows that the association between the gamma oscillations and reports of experience are strongest in the, uh, in the prefrontal area of the brain. And that's what's depicted on this plot showing the, the, the red in, in the front. Um, so the final topic is on attention. And I'd like to read for Your Holiness and for the audience one of my all-time favorite quotes from a, from a Western psychologist. Uh, and this was written by William James in 1890. 
uh, in, from his Principles of Psychology, and he has a whole chapter in that two-volume text, uh, a whole chapter on attention. And um, he says in that chapter, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compo sui if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. And I think that if William James had more exposure to the contemplative traditions, he would have seen that there are methods available for educating attention. And the italics in this quote actually is in the original, uh, in the original William James. And um, Dan just reminded me that I have two minutes left. So in two minutes, just to say that one of the ways we've evaluated attention in many different ways, and one of the ways we evaluate attention is what's called the attentional blink task, which is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Uh, and what it involves is simply the, the, the fact that if you are presented with very, very rapid stimuli, like if you are presented with letters uh, 10 times a second, so each letter is only appearing for a tenth of a second, if every now and then you introduce a number and you ask a person to report on the number, if you present one number and then a second number quickly after it, they don't see the second number. Most people don't see the second number. And it's as if they get so excited for the, at the first number that they lose the ability to see the second number. They become uh, blinded or their, their attention blinks. Uh, and it's a kind of uh, uh, identification or attachment to the first number. Uh, and so they don't see the second number. And so we tested whether three months of intensive meditation would change that. And it changes it very dramatically. So people are much more sensitive and aware, and they're much less likely to show this attentional blink. So I won't show those data. <laughs> And, and finally, uh, uh, I just, this is the most important slide. I uh, just want to, every day I feel such tremendous gratitude for the wonderful people, many of whom you met, Your Holiness, when you were last in Madison, uh, who are the ones who are actually doing the work. Uh, and uh, Antoine Lutz, in particular, has been uh, uh, such an important part of this endeavor. Uh, and uh, John Dunn was uh, a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin when this work first began and was inf so influential in helping us. And also, of course, uh, Mathieu La. Uh, and uh, work that I haven't had time to talk about today with mindfulness-based stress reduction has been uh, so importantly uh, helped by uh, the wonderful collaboration and friendship with John Kabat-Zinn, who's with us today. So uh, I'd like to just end with thanking all those people and thanking you, Your Holiness. R Richie, thank you for that state-of-the-art overview of uh, some of your findings before we move on. Your Holiness, do you have any questions? It's all in saying that there's been an attention blink on his heart. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. Having, having seen, having caught the first number, he then didn't see the second. <laughs> actually, I think knowing that means that you don't have an attentional blink. 
אתה מבין שיש לך ימי לא? ‫אוקיי. ‫-אה, תשאיר לך. ‫לבן נובע, ‫למה רנק נובע שבע יונה מנה, ‫תשאיר לך דליה, ‫דאז יש לזה מיוצ'יק, ‫לוצ'ו קונליה, ‫דאז יש לזה, ‫לוצ'ו צ'מישו, ‫דאז יש לזה, 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 ‫דאז יש ชิกเลี้ยงไปหรอวะกูชอบจริงจริงนั่นแหละหรอวะนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่นแหละนั่
So uh, this morning um, we heard from Jimpla about the, the path, but we just heard that there was a path. We didn't hear much about the details. And we've asked Matthew to uh, give us, to unpack that, to, to go into more detail about the specifics of practice. And to do it in a way that it engages uh, neuroscience. So this morning, student Jimbala said that he's feeling like passing exam, but I don't feel even to qualify to reach to the level of passing exams. So it's more like exposing my own shortcomings uh, or lightning a match in clear daylight. But anyway, I heard a lot from my great teachers, His Holiness and Bjorken Kensir Moshe, so I'll try my best. So, as student Jimbala said this morning, uh, he outlined very well the ground, path, and fruit, and view, meditation, action, as well as the three types of training on discipline, concentration, and wisdom. So how do we actually apply that? And how does it relate to our studies? So when we began our studies, we thought we could try all kinds 
of meditations and training. But then we quickly remembered what His Holiness said this morning, that there are two main goals, to expand our knowledge and also what contribution can we make to society. So in the very beginning, almost like playing, we tried devotion, visualizations, all kinds of things. But we thought we're not going to teach that in education in a secular way. So that's why we chiefly concentrated on focused attention, on cultivating altruistic love and compassion, and emotional balance to open presence. Because those could be easily, uh, the universal value of those trainings could easily be available for children, for adults, for all kinds of works of life in a secular way. But of course, those come from the complete part of practice. So now, this is a very vast subject, of course, like the, the words of the Buddha from Sanskrit into Tibetan fill 103 volumes. The commentary of all the great pandits is 213 volumes, so it's hard to summarize in, 15, in 12 minutes. Uh, but basically, the, the Tibetan word for Buddha, Sangye, gives the idea, Sang means to purify, to clarify, eliminate all veils and obscuration that need to be eliminated. And Gye means to bloom, to complete, to bring to perfection everything that needs to be developed and cultivated. So fundamentally, what do we need to purify or to get rid of? Is the fundamental ignorance, as we defined it this morning, misconstruing reality, and the effect of this misconstruing reality, that is the five mental toxins, uh, including, of course, mental confusion, but also hatred, craving, uh, arrogance, uh, envy, and so forth, that completely obscures our mind and brings suffering. So what needs to be cleared is ignorance and its consequences in terms of suffering. What needs to be cultivated or developed are the wisdom and then what goes together with wisdom, the compassion. And ultimately what is perfected is consummate wisdom, perfect wisdom, unconditional compassion to all sentient beings and freedom from all the causes of suffering. Now how do we go about that? That's where the graded part comes about and practice. So there are each aspect of the path, there are things to be purified, there are things to be matured, and there are things to be perfected. It's that in Tibetan. So then, how do, you how do you get into that? First, you must bring your mind onto some kind of path. If you think that samsara is such a great place, then why should you want to get out of that? So, and very often we are addicted to the cause of suffering. That's our problem. So, <clears throat> most of those paths begin by deep reflection. And by the way, when we say meditation or bhavana or cultivating or familiarization, there's always two aspects. Analytical. What is the nature of the world? We can analyze whether the phenomena are permanent or impermanent. Are they autonomous or interdependent? That's a huge consequences on our happiness and suffering. But then also there's to integrate that. So now, in the beginning, we need to combine those by reflections that will turn our mind and set us on this path of liberation and enlightenment. So first of all, we need to value the potential that we have, precious human existence. If we think that this is, doesn't matter how we spend this life and then we die just as with empty hands, as we say. It's like going to Jewel Island and coming with empty hands. We need to appreciate that even we have this precious human life, it won't last long. It can be taken away any moment. That is certain, the time is uncertain. Those are crucial reflections. And if we want to get free from suffering, we cannot just do anything that comes in our mind. The law of causality says that there are things that will bring suffering, some that will contribute to alleviate suffering. And then somehow, we need to recognize that you cannot repair samsara. It's a hopeless sort of endless conflict and suffering. So we need to find ways to get out of this. So that's what the, will bring your mind. That's what fundamental reflection that any practitioner will begin with. And this will be aspect of meditation. That will be aspect of reflection. 
And then we say, who can help me in this hopeless state? Then you think about ordinary people, parents, educators, they're all in the same boat, in the same mess. So then that's why the notion of refuge, not just being simply the fears of samsara, but the fear of continuing all of us to endlessly suffer. So what can do? Someone who has got out of suffering. So that's what an enlightened being like the Buddha. How did he get out of it? That's his teaching, the Dharma. And who can help me on the way? That's the companion. So the notion of refuge makes a sense. It's not just a blind faith refuge. And then, so we will practice on that. And practically, there are a set of practices that we'll repeat many times. There's a well-known so-called fundamental or preliminary practice. Each of those steps will be done 100,000 times. Why? There's no magic number. It's simply we're lazy. So we need some kind of encouragement to do this 100,000 times so well, we don't do it at all, basically. So this is the actual sitting where we will take refuge 100,000 times with the visualization, with the right attitude. And then we will think, should I do that only for myself? It's meaningless. If all my, I am, all my friends are in jail and I just get out of jail, I'm alone out there, it's seems to be pointless. I go back to jail because my friends are there. <laughs> so then the spirit of enlightenment. I will do that. I will achieve enlightenment so that I gain the capacity to free all beings. So that's the bodhicitta. Bodhicitta has to be prepared by boundless loving kindness, boundless compassion, boundless rejoicing, boundless unbiased equanimity or impartiality. But then we'll also recite 100,000 times this not just mechanically reciting, but with putting a whole intention, cultivation. So that's a process. Then if we are on any travel, there are obstacles, we need provisions, and we need to dispel to clear all the way. So clearing the way are purification practice. And what we purify is not by some kind of original sin, because according to Buddhism, we have the Buddha nature, original goodness. But everything that obscures that, all the veils of emotions, the veils that distort reality, we need to clear that. So there's a practice for that, with visualization. There are beautiful images. Of course, we cannot go in detail. But we also will do 100,000 times those practices. It will take, even you do that full time, it will take a month or two. <coughs> then there's, uh, we need provisions on the part, <coughs> accumulation of merit and wisdom. So there are practices specifically related to this accumulation making boundless offerings in your mind, offering the whole universe in all its beauty, offering your own body mentally, offering all the virtue that you have done. So that will be also done 100,000 times. And then you start with this limited mind. And especially in many aspects of Buddhism, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a special relation with the spiritual teacher, which has a vast, compassionate, wisdom mind. And we start with this limited, fragmented, selfish mind. So there's a practice called Guru Yoga. It means to unite with the Guru's mind. That means our soul, small mind, as Swamiji said, which is like in a small vase, so, so breaks away and merge with the wisdom mind of the teacher. So that's one step that we also do, accompanied with mantras, with reciting verses that will remind us that. Of course, all of those steps will also go with the contemplative aspect of sitting and integrating that. And then we go to the next step which is to change our perception of the phenomenal world. Usually we divide this in pleasant, unpleasant, beautiful, ugly, desirable, undesirable. From the Buddhist perspective, this is called impure perception. Impure because it doesn't correspond to reality. If we understand reality as being devoid of intrinsic existence, a rose is not intrinsically beautiful, it's just my mind, somehow I feel it like that. A goat will think it's a nice salad. As another organism will see as nothing. So we have this impure perception. So then there's a vast uh, richness of visualization. And sometimes people are quite uh, hard to understand why there's so much imagery, so much kind of deities and mandalas. What do they mean? It's simply a way to not to make some more, even more artificial projection upon reality, but to recognize our own true nature. Those are symbolic representation. For instance, Avalokiteshvara with the four arms, 
It's not that any being somewhere has four harms, it's the four boundless of compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, and rejoicing. So likewise, we will, with the help of that, recognize what we call the infinite purity of phenomena. That means all phenomena, no matter what, comes into phenomena through their empty nature, through interdependence. They are not solidly existing. That's how they are pure in a way. So if you can recognize that, it's pure from the superimposition, from the projection, from the distortion. So that's a very important part of the practice because we are so much enmeshed in that delusion. So we need a strong antidote. So all that is the play of antidotes versus the things that need to be purified, matured, and perfected. Then we go to some practices. So that also will take a long time, and it could take years, and we could continue that throughout our life along with other practices, doing visualization, recitation, understanding the ultimate nature of phenomena. Basically, the union of appearance and emptiness, that's sort of the, 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 the essence of those visualization practices. Then, of course, as we mentioned, there are inner practices with the prana, with the, with the channels, with the energies. That's also a part that is sometimes cultivated. But ultimately, as the Buddha said, this whole teaching is about transforming the mind. He said, give up all unvirtue or negativity, perfect all virtue, and to transform the mind, that's the Buddha's teaching, or to subdue the mind. So in the end, we have to understand that famous sort of mind, what's behind that. So there are a lot of practices to help one see the workings of the mind, how thoughts come, how one emotion comes and invades the mind. How, what kind of antidote, direct antidote, like loving kindness or benevolence to subdue hatred, or not identifying with hatred, just the awareness that is aware of hatred, but it's not, there's no hate in the awareness. So there's countless profound, skillful methods that we can use at all times to be first more aware of what's going on in the mind and to slowly phase away the mental toxins to replace them by only wholesome mental state, like compassion and so forth. But in the end, it also comes to the ultimate understanding of awareness, what is the fundamental nature of mind. It is given many different names. We could call the luminous continuum of, aware of the fundamental mind. We could call that the recognition of the Buddha nature. We could call that pure awareness, and so forth. And that's where it becomes the most contemplative aspect. This is something that lies behind the curtain of thoughts, of discursive thoughts. It is what is left when there is no content even. So in a way, this morning and yesterday, a lot was said about the unknown, the undescribable, the absolute truth. Well, it is as it says also by Shantideva, the absolute truth is sort of beyond the intellect. It's not the object of discursive, reflective words, descriptions, and so forth. It doesn't mean that it's out of reach of the experience. That would mean that the Buddha would not know what is unknown. There will be <laughs> something that will be forever unreachable. It's simply that it is not knowable. It is not known by an ordinary deluded mind that is constantly veiled by dualistic grasping, by mental toxins, by fundamental ignorance. But when those are dispelled, what is left is pure awareness. And it's a non-dual, self-luminous awareness that is given different names. And ultimately, this is one of the quality of the unchanging wisdom of Buddhahood. So that's a very short, uh, overview of the path, but the main point is that all those steps need to be cultivated again and again. You know, bhavana, gom, means to cultivate, to become familiar. It's something that will only come to the taste of experience. And of course, the clear, unmistaken instruction that comes from the scriptures, that come from a qualified, authentic spiritual teacher who can condense those 84,000 sections of the Dharma into pit instructions that on the path it will deliver to the disciple as he or she progresses on the path and give it the right instruction at the moment where the disciple is able to 
precisely benefit from those instructions because the maturation process is just such that it's ready to cross that next step. So there we need determination and enthusiasm and endeavor, but no impatience. You know, when the weed grows, there's no point pulling the, the, the green, the green uh, <laughs> grass. It won't grow faster. It will just kill the, the weed. But the maturation process will take time. But that time is the sign that something is really happening. So we should not hope for swift reward, but we should practice, as Milarepa said, until our head falls, I mean the last breath of our life. And the other great yogi Shapka said, may the duration of the, your practice be the duration of your life. And so that's, I think, the ideal of a practitioner. So definitely, it's not a quick fix, but it is also the most worthy thing you can do, because once you have a sense of direction, it doesn't matter if there's 10,000 kilometers to go, and it won't help if you work sideways or backwards. The best way is to still continue to move forwards, <laughs> So that's what the party is about. Thank you, Thank you. Was that right, Your Holiness? Hmm? Was he right? Normal, <laughs> 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 good. Okay. Yeah, you got a good grade. You passed the exam. John, did you have? No. Okay. Uh, we've just heard an, an extraordinary overview of the path. And we've also seen some very um, fine, hard data. How did you get there from here? How did you two collaborate? How did you know what to study? How did you tell us? Well, uh, Matthew, you want to go first? Um, I mean, did you suggest what should be studied, or did you offer a menu? Or? Well, you know, at some point, we have to adjust ourselves. You know. Because mutual calibration. Yeah, mutual <laughs> calibration. <laughs> and that was going on. So His Holiness is wondering, um, you know, up to, up to this point, probably this research has not been done, but maybe we could look specific at specific types of states. For example, um, there is a general understanding in the Buddhist tradition that when you focus your mind on cultivating certain qualities such as deep devotion to your teacher or a great admiration, you know, cultivate a state of mind in a very admiring state, there is an understanding that the mind sort of lifts up. It's in a more uplifted state of mind. But on the other hand, when you reflect upon the suffering nature, there's a certain dampening effect on the mind. So therefore, his question is, you know, would you be uh, uh, thinking of uh, imagining a situation where you would study a practitioner who will be remain f in a single pointed state of deep devotion or faith, or a deep state of admiration, or a very you know deep state of reflecting upon suffering? Well, I think that uh, uh, the the ability of a practitioner to uh, to remain focused in that way would, uh, I think, maximize the likelihood that we would actually see differences if a practitioner um, was filled with, with a deep admiration uh, compared to a situation where they were um, uh, just uh, very focused on, on suffering. I think that there, there clearly would be a difference. From all we know about uh, the brain and emotion, uh, we should be able to see those kinds of differences. Actually, we did that in first time in 2001, then doing a mugu, this unconditional mugu, devotion, yes. and I was really thinking so deeply of my teacher that I had tears in my eyes. But 
we thought that to study that for months and years and involve a lot of resources, uh, this doesn't, didn't seem to have an immediate, uh, you know, fulfilling the goal of uh, pursuing secular uh, contribution. But as fundamental research, I think that we, we could possibly now come back to that and investigate those other states like mental imagery, focusing on, on the visualization or focusing on devotion to the guru. I mean, those, of course, are, are very different states, even both involve focused attention. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, it's one was referring to an earlier um, statement in one of the early, you know, earlier modern life um, dialogues. Someone mentioned the fact that um, for at the, you know, at the brain level, uh, the, the the pain centers that gets activated when you are experiencing undergoing your own pain seems to be also the same centers that are associated in empathy when you take upon some, you know, when you view someone else's pain. Yes, actually, that's the seminal work of, uh, uh, of Wolf's daughter, Tanya Singer, who uh, uh, you've hmm? met on a number of occasions, Your Holiness, who, who, who showed exactly that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm wondering, uh, anger or compassion, uh, and during dream time, also is the occur. Uh, sometimes even sort of tear, too much sort of compassion sort of experience during dream, and actually you see tear come. Uh, so I'm wondering, the awakening state, while the sensorial sort of consciousness still function or active and meditate on, because uh, the meditate or, I don't know, anger, develop anger. And dream time, this sensorial consciousness not active. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the differences at the brain level? Yeah. Well, actually, Your Holiness, we're involved right now in um, probably the largest study that's ever been done on meditation and sleep. Mm -hmm where we have practitioners come to the laboratory, uh, both expert as well as more novice practitioners. Oh. And uh, in some cases, the experts will um, practice for a day intensively, and then they go into the sleep laboratory at night, and we monitor their, their brain activity during sleep and during dreams uh, to evaluate just these sorts of questions. Uh, so, um, uh, w one of the really interesting things is from modern research, we know that one of the areas of the brain that's most active during dreaming sleep mm -hmm. is the amygdala. The amygdala is a, an area that's um, been implicated in emotion. Uh, and uh, so uh, it will be very interesting to see how the practitioners, um, particularly after s we have them come in and spend a day doing, um, uh, meditating on compassion. Uh, and we also have them doing a day uh, where they're uh, uh, doing a Vipassana practice. Uh, and um, looking at the difference in the influence uh, on the brain during, during sleep and dreaming. So we don't know the answer yet, but we're, we're actually collecting the data. So far, have you come across any sort of practitioner or ordinary people who who can uh, uh, who can develop sort of awareness during dream. Now I'm in the state of sleep, and now I'm dreaming. 
there are people. Yes, yes, hmm? we, we have. We have tested uh, a so couple. So what, what, what differences? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, so this is wondering um, whether you would see a difference between just ordinary people who are not able to recall that they are dreaming, become be aware that they are dreaming, and those individuals who seem to have this capacity, practitioners or not. Recall, recall. Uh, sorry, uh, be, become aware. Oh, dream, become aware dream sleep. Whilst, whilst in dream. Well, uh, we, we have some very preliminary data. Uh, which is very preliminary, but we've just analyzed the first uh, group of uh, 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 six practitioners uh, that we've tested during sleep. Uh, and um, the gamma oscillations that we see during waking yes. that I've shown you, we find are present during sleep uh, in these longer term practitioners. Uh, and it's, we, we have not seen these kind of gamma oscillations during sleep before. Uh, and so uh, this is something that may be associated with the increased propensity to be aware during dreaming. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're actually looking at. But uh, the presence of these gamma oscillations during sleep is very unusual. But getting back to Dan's question, Your Holiness, I wanted to just ask you, uh, Matthew and I uh, and several other groups in, in North America have, have uh, 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 been collaborating and there are uh, some wonderful fruits of the direct collaboration between contemplatives and scientists. And I wonder if you can um, speak to our Indian brothers and sisters about the prospect of collaboration here in India and um, what suggestion or advice you may have to, to help promote that in, in the Indian context. Uh, some time ago is our meeting I mentioned. You see, there are uh, some practitioner. Uh, I think some sadhu. You see, actually, you see, who spent, uh, I think, uh, years in mountain area. And some cases I was told, uh, very cold so the, what was the, place, uh, place uh, but naked. So certainly they have the practice or experience of sandalini, you know, sandalini. Uh, no. ka. Tumu. Tumu. Yeah, tumu. Yeah, tumu. Oh. Uh, and then, uh, so it's, it's such people, uh, obviously, uh, through training, through sort of, because of the meditation, and a certain body's element, because uh, of that. Become expressed now. Never pain. So some some uh, properties of the body within the body has become really advanced. So there are yogis who actually test their level of tumor efficiency um, by being in a very cold place and with only a very simple loins cloth. And the, the test involves during the night to wear a, a, a cloth that has been soaked in water and wrapping them over. And it is said that they can go through five or six rounds of this wet cloth during the night and dry it up. So one uh, now, uh, no longer on this planet, 
but I know one. Uh, it seems he have some sort of extraordinary experiences. Yes. And so through exercise, through, through practice of control, inner energy. Uh, for example, that, 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 so some, uh, this particular meditator is no longer with us. As a result of his control of the physiological processes, uh, is able to draw in through his sexual organ uh, liquids like water and mm. milk. So you see, uh, so that means uh, certain ability, control, inner energy, or energy, or lung, lung, uh, so some cases, through meditation, you should put some sand here, and then energy left. So from the tip of the finger, oh. yeah. And then literally blow the dust, but you know, just <laughs> keeping over it. Now, unfortunately, no one here. <laughs> Uh, so such things you see happen. Actually, some people actually notice or also observe so, it. No. So, like that. So in any way, some, some sadhu, I think, still is available, isn't it? I think eventually we should, you see, uh, uh, firstly, communicate with such people. Uh, this is not because of them making their name or something, publicity. But simply try to show through scientific way the true meditation, actual body element can control all things. It is important. There are such people there. So I think uh, uh, among, among Buddhists, among the Buddhists, also is there some people that the problem is they don't care. <laughs> about our sort of activities. They do not understand. So for them it feels like the scientific experiments is like playing <laughs> no, playing over them, playing playing on them. Yeah. Uh, some form of exploitation of their spiritual experiences. <laughs> uh, but actually, you see, these are important. Uh, isn't it? This is my view. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> but sometimes it's difficult to pursue such people. Mm. And then also is some people claim some very extraordinary sort of power or something. That I am very skeptical. <laughs> I don't believe. Uh, if we ask them, then please come here, we're going to test. I think then they do not dare. <laughs> 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 So, Your, Your Holiness, you're giving a very difficult task to our <laughs> Indian colleagues. You're telling them to find the most talented, advanced meditators who don't want to be studied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wolf had a comment. Yeah, it was just following up what you said, that there are some of the phenomena observed here which um, advanced meditators take for granted. For them, this is just natural. Mm. For us scientists, yes. this is an enormous challenge because if these things really happen, um, we know that we do something wrong because for many of these phenomena, we have no explanation whatsoever. It does not fit the current uh, scheme of our descriptions. So it would be of utmost importance if we would have reproducible phenomena of that kind because science requires some reproducibility to see whether this is really there and if it is um, then we can try to find out what it is but it could also be <coughs> that we have to give in and say we cannot explain and that's the end of our, our abilities 
So I think it's a very important step to be taken. Um, and the problem is reproducibility. Um, and it could be that many of these phenomena just occur once in the life of one person. That there are singularities because time flows and they never come back and you cannot predict them. So have you got an example of any of these phenomena that would be the best to approach? Because it is um, simple in your eyes, reproducible. Um, uh, a distinction needs to be made between certain types of what ordinarily might seem as unique you know, uh, characteristics of individuals' uh, behavior. There are certain, in some cases, there are trained and acquired capacities. So in which case one would expect these to be reproducible because they are acquired, trained characteristics. But in some cases could be there are individuals who may have some inborn kind of, you know, uh, characteristics, in which case because they are not acquired through training, then they are unpredictable. You don't know when it's going to come. So one needs to make a distinction between these two. But what His Holiness is talking about are the, the first type, the characteristics that are acquired through training. Um. So my part, of course, uh, I will give in my mind, well, my mind, and when such occasions come, such person, if say, I meet, no? uh, I meet, uh, yeah. I meet, uh, and then I will, I will pursue them, and then also meantime, uh, uh, among Hindu practitioner or Jain practitioner, uh, certainly, uh, I think possible. Uh, firstly, we uh, inquire, and yeah. uh, then when we find such people, then request them. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, the test is something important, uh, necessary. Uh, so then they may agree. And we can arrange a special sort of room where some eyes put. <laughs> <laughs> and they remain still naked. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Oh. This was done at Harvard University oh. by, by Herbert Benson. But that's right. Yes, that's right. but it didn't work out too well. Oh. So, uh, I think it was very difficult to do the experiment because they had so many different probes inside of the yogi's body that he wasn't able to meditate ag adequately. And I think that's one of the difficulties of this kind of study is that it can be very disturbing. It, yes, even, that's Even right. for the adept, if, if, there's t if the experiment itself is too invasive, invasive, drawing blood and so on, then these kinds of studies can be very difficult to execute properly. So that was actually, I think, a failure for Benson. He wasn't able to study Tumo adequately because of this, this situation. One of these yogis, I think you knew. Yes, and, uh, some of that I know. Yes, yeah. And I actually took care of him for a few days while he was there. And this was many years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very happy to participate, but he said he was not really able to, uh, to make the, the psychic, the Tumo energy uh, blaze hmm. because of the conditions in the laboratory. But so that's was, was it a fully was it a collaborative in the sense of rich and no? Magic? And I think that's I mean I think that's the issue here uh, is that uh, and I recall in, in some of the contexts of experimental design that I was also involved in that a lot of the in order to do these types of studies these are very difficult I think but even to do something more mundane concerning emotional reactivity how can compassion meditation change one's reactivity to negative emotions. Uh, even to study that adequately, I think, takes a very careful dialogue between the practitioner 
and the scientist mm. so that the practice is really carefully understood on the one hand and its effects can be properly measured on the other. And that took a long time, I think, in the context of the studies at Wisconsin. Um, so just to continue in the spirit of dialogue, I first wanted to thank uh, Your Holiness and all the other presenters here for organizing this meeting because, um, as you pointed out, uh, the Nalanda tradition uh, is perhaps uh, being revived. So I might want to call it the Navya Nalanda uh, <laughs> tradition. Navya is the Sama, mm. so Nalanda Sama. Mm. <laughs> right? And, and that perhaps one of the ways in which this revival will take place is through inputs from the Tibetan uh, texts that are now being made available back in uh, both in Sanskrit and in English. And uh, of course, science, because again, um, science was not alien to that uh, cultural ethos. And, and I think that there's a parallel here between uh, what happened in the West, in the, perhaps in the 15th century, where Greek material what became available through Arabic, and the sciences started. Um, I mean, the revival of the sciences in the West was itself due to new material coming from other parts of the world. So I do think that uh, Indians should embrace these different influences um, while, of course, sticking to what, what we do well. And there's a famous, of course, um, saying by Gandhiji saying that, um, I want to open the windows of my house to the world, but I don't want to be blown off my feet. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Right? <laughs> and, and in that spirit, I, I, of course, it interests me how such a wonderful collaboration has happened. And I just want to make a couple of suggestions about how this form of collaboration could be extended. I, I myself am a theoretical scientist. And one of the most important developments in science is not just the, uh, and which differentiates modern science from um, earlier Western approaches to the natural world is that um, theoretical advances were exceptionally important, especially the use of mathematics and other technical languages. So how uh, Galileo and Newton used mathematics to explore the physical world is the paradigm upon which the rest of the sciences are based on. And one thing I notice in the Indian literature is the extensive theoretical vocabulary and technical taxonomy and other uh, literature that is available. And so along with the sharing of ideas between contemplative practitioners and experimental scientists, I believe that there should be a similar and parallel interaction between the uh, theoretical basis of the modern cognitive and neurosciences and the corresponding literature in the Tibetan and in the Sanskrit sources. So for example, in the Abhidharma literature, there's a very detailed taxonomy of mental states, whether it is contemplative or not. One of the things to do, one of the things to do would be to see if we can collect this kind of mental taxonomy from the different traditions in, from India and East Asia and learn how to operationalize them and perhaps build upon that taxonomy. I, I'm just, this is now wild speculation, but a crucial departure from which modern science took was what Newton and Leibniz did by replacing old geometry by calculus, right? And my question would be if a similar kind of technical and theoretical advance took place in which is based in the traditional Indic sources, but makes a step forward, that would be a huge benefit for everybody. And that contemplative neuroscience, and what I would call contemplative psychophysics, should, should be a field in which theory, experiment, and philosophy are integrated, and take as many different sources as possible. I just don't think we should make any difference, mm -hmm. differentiation mm -hmm. between you know, science or, or Sanskrit, because I, I mean, ultimately, these are all just different human sources of knowledge that we should, everybody should use. Okay. 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 All right. No. Yes. 
I, I think we've been speaking at a, a, a very interesting level uh, in terms of a, a certain level of abstraction and very advanced practices, Your Holiness. And I wanted to ask you also your opinion on another uh, another style of research that's been very important in Richie's lab. So some, stu some of this type of research is often called basic science mm -hmm. and even examining, let's say, TUMO. So my, my colleague at uh, Emory University, Chuck Rezon, in fact, became interested in the study of meditation through the study of this jandali, the, the TUMO energy, because it seems to be related possibly to the immune system, in fact. Mm -hmm. and he, he also was never able to really, they actually do have a study now, a new one at Boston University, uh, studying TUMO adepts, but there is, no, there is no results from that study yet. But he eventually then, because he was a clinician, he became interested also in the application of meditation practices in a secular context. And uh, the, one of the big questions in that, in that context is, what, is, what are the key ingredients of a meditation that one can extract from the traditional context and apply them to a clinical context? So as you know, at Emory University, my colleague Gishi Losan Tenzin has developed this com uh, cognitive-based compassion training, which is based upon a traditional Tibetan form of compassion meditation, extracted from that, and now is being used for foster children. For example, the government of the state of Georgia, uh, where Emory is located, has uh, sponsored uh, a very extensive research project on this compassion protocol uh, that's completely secular for these foster children. And likewise, Jimbala, I know, is involved at Stanford University with a similar style of research. I'm wondering, uh, in the context of the Indic practices, you think this is also a, a practical way to go? Not so, perhaps a little bit less, uh, how to put it, uh, a little bit less mystical and a little bit less fantastic than examining uh, some of the more advanced practices, but, all, but looking a little, bit, a little bit more concretely at the effects of practices on ordinary persons and how they might be translated into the lives of ordinary persons. Uh, do you think this style of research also is quite feasible here in India? And do you have any suggestions? I, I think, uh, many of you already know, but I do some that I may not know. Uh, so I want to, uh, to share. Uh, that is, actually, when we start mm -hmm. this dialogue, uh, sometimes the people the city use the word dialogue between no <laughs> complicated no. <laughs> dialogue between Buddhism and science. And I thought that's wrong. Uh, that creates sort of the wrong impression, right? Or misunderstanding. misunderstanding. And actually, uh, Buddhism only for Buddhists, uh, not universal. And our sort of, uh, I think uh, this morning I mentioned two purposes. One, simply uh, expand. Knowledge. Our knowledge, uh, and then also even <coughs> the more sort of spiritual side, uh, uh, that also a secular basis. So therefore, uh, as soon as you touch Buddhism, then uh, no longer as a secular. So, so therefore, uh, right from the beginning. Uh, the, I, may, I make clear So this morning uh, a reference was made to the nature of reality, the ground. Oh, that's simply, what is the, what is the reality? Uh, no idea of langdor. No evaluative judgment of what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. So Buddhism, you see, mentioned about this mind in order to practice, uh, the, uh, to carry Buddhist path. But we can live it. Hmm? Simply try to know the reality.
So that I call Buddhist science. About matters, about minds, about time. Uh, so, uh, so I mentioned, you see, they, uh, we should use the word dialogue between modern science and Buddhist science, not Buddhism. So three parts, Buddhist science, uh, on that basis, some Buddhist concept, and, and on also philosophy. There may be some aspects, uh, as sort of was the uh, universal kind of concept, maybe. Uh, some, some of that, very close related with Buddhist religion. So there are two. One part in the Buddhist philosophy can be uh, so the, seen as the, universal. The, uh, basis, basis or so the, call, <coughs> uh, the no, it's, a, it's a support of. Yeah. Uh, support of secular ethics. Then Buddhist religion. So I want to, sh uh, to tell you uh, that when we carry this research, uh, uh, like uh, others, Jains or different Hindus, you see the religious part should kasoda. Should be left uh, separated. Uh, uh, then the certain ideas, the certain sort of kasoda. Concepts, uh, practices. Uh, 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 and part, I think in uh, those ancient in, in Indian tradition, I, as I mentioned earlier, you see the, every tradition where the samadhi, vipassana, and kasati, uh, Kalesha. Kalesha. Uh, naturally, uh, the more explanation about consciousness, about mind. So that consider as a part of the science. 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 So that I think should cause that. Yeah, uh, be part of the dialogue. Uh, right? Part of the dialogue. And that is universal and something common and very useful for uh, for promoting secular ethics. So samadhi itself, basically uh, secular, secular sorry, uh, mm. uh, universal. Mm. Mm. Samadhi as a mental quality is universal. Uh, in fact, in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, we refer to these meditative states as being part of the common currency of the classical Indian traditions. Uh, so that I want to. Uh, Share. To, make, uh, to share and uh, make clear. So there's nothing to do with one's own religion. As far as our, our approach, we are not seeking sort of support from science to Buddhism. No, never. <laughs> Without scientific support, Buddhism will remain. <laughs> and as well as Jain, Jainism or Hin different Hinduism. It's a thousand years. Uh, it it brings immense benefit to practitioner. That's, that's sufficient for the survival. Uh, so whether scientists uh, accept or not, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> So sometimes I you see telling some scientists, you see, they are out of their curiosity. It's a certain sort of other point, like uh, next life. Then usually I say, oh, that is Buddhist business, not sci that's scientific. scientist Buddhist business, like that. <laughs> uh, like that. So that I think I uh, should know. So our dialogue purely on the Kasoda reality. Uh, not our practice like that. Your Holiness. Um, Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've told us that many times. <laughs> uh, what you say is very inspiring and I would like to hear a few more words because as you know, the various Indian traditions and even within Buddhism itself, there are lots of debates about what is the nature 
of reality, uh. right? I mean, there is both common currency using, say, the Pramana systems, but also there is wide differentiation. Yes. So do you have any thoughts about how we can accommodate both? And not just, not, I mean, you know, not just the similarities, but also the differences. Menjadi <laughs> On the basic kind of ontological standpoint, uh, for example, like the postulation of you know, matter and consciousness as two primary mm -hmm. facts of the world, um, Solin was saying that he wouldn't expect there to be difference among the classical Indian traditions. Now, there might be difference on, for example, what is the specific nature of that ignorance? Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental ignorance. Mm -hmm. So then the one might begin to see differences. Even within the Buddhism, mm -hmm. even within the Sanskrit tradition, there are differences. Differences of mm -hmm. uh, Due to different views. Mm -hmm. So like that. When I was in the Buddhism, I was in the Buddhism, for example, like if we take the uh, mental phenomena like anger, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's phenomenologically evident that most you know people will be able to identify what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I mean, even to some extent, animals too, when they mm -hmm. see a hostile animal, they seem to sort of shy away from that most mm -hmm. angry animal. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are universal, mm -hmm. and how harmful. Mm -hmm. This destructive emotion. Mm -hmm. So, if there is possibility to reduce these things, now everybody accept, whether believer or non-believer. And the positive emotions such as compassion, also even animals appreciate. So, these are universal. So, here we are seeking some support mm -hmm. from scientific sort of. Uh, mm -hmm. Some scientists, sci yeah. scientific research, yeah. right? Scientific inquiry. Oh, yeah. Mainly, you see, they uh, cultivate more compassionate sort of mind, mm -hmm. immense benefit, one's own health, mm -hmm. and the family, and the community. So these are, uh, I, know I think, with as a result of cooperation, collaboration, collaboration, it's very very useful. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think, I think reality, the ordinary people, uh, Buddha state that, Mahavira state that, may not pay much attention. <laughs> or latest scientific finding like that, they pay more attention. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I jokingly telling you, is it Buddhist? Traditionally, the three, I said the refuge, refuge, uh, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Now should be four, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, Science. <laughs> <laughs> so these scientists become guru now. <laughs> yes? The, yeah, John. Well, actually, I, 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 Raj, Rajesh's idea is an interesting one, Your Holiness, because I was also having a discussion uh, with Dr. Nagendra at lunch, and uh, one thought, there are differences among the traditions, but, and there are a lot of commonalities, and one thought was actually to look at, for example, a very specific aspect of, of cognition, for example, about, let's say, look at attention, and in the Abhidharma, there are many features, me mental facets, or semjung, that are about attention, many of them, for example, Yidla Jebar, Manasikara, and Jampa or Smriti, but there are others that are relevant to attention. There are similar accounts in other Indic traditions. Yes. And we were talking about the idea that you could have the, not to try to do the whole brain or the whole mind at once, or all the, all the features of consciousness, but just look at some special feature like attention, for example, mm -hmm. 
Look at the different traditions, see how they compare, see what they overlap, what they differ on, and right. then bring in a cognitive scientist, mm -hmm. or a few cognitive scientists, and have them enter into this discussion and try to develop a vocabulary, let's say, just about attention, that compares all of the different traditions and also some features of cognitive science. It seemed that that could then lead to also an empirical research yes. program. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and to integrate empirical research into both the dialogue between these traditions so that empirical science is not just a dialogue partner with the traditions but actually as a tool for the traditions themselves to talk to each other. Yep. The empirical science, the dialogue is a jigbo mayimba. Empirical science is the JBS course of Mandarin Nigu Yuza. They are to the Susu Tone, but the Yilichev and the Simjung Namja Delia. They are soon on Madame Buduna and the Pimzungi. I think there's uh, one another aspect that this collaboration uh, can help. Uh, you know, science takes complex phenomena and then try to re reduce it into different elements, uh, more simple, more easily to identify, that can be then be studied. And that also comes with the notion of uh, vocabulary, mm -hmm. we say anger, or we say compassion. Uh, there are so many kinds of anger, so many sh nuances to compassion. Mm -hmm. So both in uh, the Buddhist vocabulary, which is very rich about mental life and mental event, and uh, the, the science also would need mm -hmm. to have corresponding ways of investigating those. So if you're studying anger, are you studying indignation in mm -hmm. the face of a massacre, or you are uh, studying hate? the sort totally different mental states. Mm -hmm. So I think here, uh, even in the process of spiritual practice, when we say we try to cultivate loving kindness of compassion, actually it's a very rich phenomenon. We are, say for instance, visualizing the unbelievable suffering of sentient beings. We realize that just as we want to be happy and not to suffer, they want the same and we recognize that. So we get concerned by their suffering or their happiness as I'm concerned with mine. So we then acknowledge the interdependency. And then we make the strong aspiration, may that suffering be dispelled. And not only that, but the causes of suffering, which is the ultimate ignorance. So there's a cognitive aspect. And then we try to cultivate that, not just a feeble mm -hmm. feeling but a very powerful, all-pervading mental state. So in that, there is a whole constellation of mental states. So we face that actually in our collaboration, compassion. And then like our friend Paul Ekman also asked me, what, do you need to feel the suffering of others? Do you be emotionally a sort of in tears? And when you think or not, can you be sort of watching with just a cognitive aspect? So Sometimes we do, when we do cultivate compassion, we do all those together. So then we got slowly the idea that how could we precisely go into those different aspects and would they have different brain signatures? Mm -hmm. So we have been especially attempting to do that with compassion, for instance. Mm -hmm. We ask the meditators to do just loving kindness toward a child, to a dear person then how does it eat if you extend it to all sentient beings? And then compassion with the person who is suffering. So we know already that we spoke about empathy, that is not very clearly yet uh, equivalent in Tibetan, but basically is the faculty to resonate with other suffering. If someone is joyful and happy, you feel also joyful. If someone is very sad, you feel sad. So if someone suffers, the brain, in your brain there is some area that has to do with suffering. But then, is it only that, compassion? Well, some of the studies that we have done, where we ask very artificially the meditator to separate that, which we don't do. Just please try to only resonate with the suffering again and again and again. Only that. Then it, means, then it becomes really some kind of unbearable. That means if it's isolated of the all other aspect, the cognitive aspect, the strong aspiration and loving kindness, then it becomes sort of dysfunctional. Just feeling, feeling, feeling the other suffering, you sort of 
burnout. And this is a well-known phenomena in people who take care of others. So then it is possible to, with the collaboration with science, to, to uh, study isolated these elements, and therefore you can better reconstruct the whole process of what the whole experience of compassion is, including all those minute phenomena. And also Buddhist uh, taxonomy has been making many efforts to distinguish those, and there's a possibility with meditators who can identify and generate in a way those things separately, which is not the way we do normally do, may help to precisely find the equivalence mm -hmm. and then have experiments that are related to all these aspects one by one, and that what is the integrated phenomena of compassion. So there, the collaboration becomes so much interactive because you're not going to say, I'm just engaged in compassion, you say, I'm just going to do empathy for a while, then I'm going to try to bring my best, the whole pervading compassion, then I'm going to extend from a dear person with some maybe attachment to a neutral person, to a difficult person, and all that will take different aspects. And the scientists should be able also to relate that with what they find. Prof, yes. It just occurred to me, another aspect, because we are not alone in the world and we are not sitting in caves, all of us, but we are embedded in a very, very rich culture, both in the, all around the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to have your opinion. Whether the emotions and um, enlightened feelings that one gets in, in a higher meditative state could be at all comparable with what we find written in the literature, what people experience when they either read a very, very well done poem, or when they listen to a piece of music, or when they look at a painting, where all those things are also captured. And I think everybody of us knows that there are moments of being taken where you forget about your little ego and you become very, very touched emotionally. Um, so the question is, are those emotions different from those that one can get that are self-generated in, in, in meditation? Or is meditation just another way to get there? Or is it really so that experts are much more competent in having emotions and these deep feelings, which are also sometimes very positive. I mean, the, the empathy that one can feel in a piece of music, um, it's hard to describe. I would say exactly the same as an enlightened uh, expert. Um, I cannot find any words for what I just experienced hearing this sep second movement of, of Schubert's quintet. So what is your feeling about these relations? There is a Dominion <laughs> 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 Indian was saying that between these two, the meditative, the generated heightened state on the one side. This is basically, uh, there are two different kinds of deep satisfaction or joyfulness. Right. One, relying on sensorial sort of input. No? Uh, input right? Right. Uh, one, uh, not relying on sensorial, but through training of mind. <coughs> So maybe the previous one, with satisfaction or joyfulness, relying on sensorial because of that. Stimulus, no? input. Oh, I think short, be shorter. Shorter period, no? Oh, so long, this facility there, and immediately after, you get that experience. very strong sort of feeling. 
then, uh, although later uh, reminds or remember the Tunjin Nadia Shache. So you can kind of later remind that experience yourself. Not the feeling. Not the feeling. Yeah. Oh. So that's, I think, uh, so the, another sort of joyfulness experience. The true mental training may be longer period. Mm -hmm. Longer lasting. Huh? Longer lasting. Mm -hmm. Here, I, I think I mentioned before also a sense of sort of sense of caring or a sense of concern of others' well-being towards one's own close friend, that actually, you know, uh, much involved attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, and then towards enemy, uh, one side, you have certain reason to oppose, but at the same time, they also have the fundamental right uh, to overcome suffering, mm -hmm. because they are also same sentient being. Uh, among human beings, the uh, same human being, they also have the right to overcome suffering. So, uh, on that basis, you develop a sort of genuine sense of concern of their well-being. Uh, the previous one, very much mixed with attachment. Later one, no attachment. So, I wonder, so the, what differences at the brain, at the brain level? level. Uh, at the brain level. Uh, in future, yeah. one practitioner, let him or let her meditate compassion towards friend, mm -hmm. oh. uh, one towards enemy, mm -hmm. then because uh, of the example. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The later one is the real mm -hmm. sort of compassion, mm -hmm. unbiased. Mm -hmm. The previous one, biased. Yeah. Yeah. So biased one uh, often goes hatred and love, hatred go together. Yeah. The later one, no. Mm -hmm. Very sort of stable. Uh, stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your Holiness, I just wanted to ask in relation to Wolf's question, uh, uh, the, the meditator is engaging in a practice which is embedded within an ethical framework uh, and typically would take certain vows or has certain aspirations. And uh, I wonder, as a neuroscientist, to what extent embedding the practice within that kind of framework actually changes the brain in, in particular ways. And I think that one of the, um, one of the tasks for neuroscience is to, to develop a neuroscience of, of, goal, uh, of uh, vows and aspirations, to see how making that kind of intentional commitment will affect the brain and change the brain's response mm -hmm. to these kinds of practices. That's how much you those So what was the specific question? So it, it, it's just a comment on the, the difference between uh, an experience of music or a painting, which is um, a, a spontaneous experience that doesn't arise within an ethical framework, uh, oh. and uh, a, uh, another kind of attentional absorption, which may occur in meditation, but it is in the context of, of an ethical framework. That may be true because I mean, in the first case, the experience is being mediated through the sensory input. Ready 
So in the case of uh, human experience of uh, a beautiful music, often the experience of that beauty can be enriched by certain knowledge of who the composer is and certain history that goes with it that, en that enriches the experience of the music. But on the other hand, we do also observe sometimes animals who seem to be totally absorbed to a beautiful music. Mm -hmm. So in their case, since they, they wouldn't have the <laughs> historical background knowledge, so his holiness is wondering what would be the difference. Mm -hmm. Really, we don't know what is their sort of attraction. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes, sometimes <coughs> my dog, mm, some noise like the computer or something, some pew like that, that dog. <laughs> <laughs> so looks to see he, uh, he or she enjoy seems uh -huh. this only is curious whether they actually can appreciate certain melody and and you know have a sort of a joyful experience or is it simply just a reaction to the sound I think uh, some, uh, of course, trained, some horses is with music, mm -hmm. they can also play. Mm -hmm. I think they enjoy. Darwin was convinced of that. And Darwin was convinced of that. So I'm going to be Darwin's follower. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Your Holiness, um, I'm getting signals that our time with you uh, for this afternoon's session is coming to an end, but it's yes. a very big day for Richie, because today the Dalai Lama de designated him as a science guru. So, congratulations. And our discussion... So, usually, usually it's a dependent <laughs> tradition. Gurus really, I think, formed this is some kind of different head. So I think you need <laughs> <laughs> And of course, our question and answer session will uh, resume uh, after His Holiness has left. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. From the resting state to a state of meditation. And it's usually the case that in the analysis of brain activity, we need sophisticated computer techniques to extract signals. And here we can visibly see a difference between the resting state and the meditation state uh, where there is a presence of high amplitude oscillations in a particular frequency range called gamma, which is a fast frequency uh, that has been implicated in uh, binding percepts together, binding different elements of a perception together. And this is some... Uh, uh, seminal so by binding what we mean is that uh, often Binding, binding. So uh, often uh, an experience involves visual perception, sounds, auditory perception. Uh, uh, if we're eating, it may involve taste. And um, uh, all of these different elements come together in our experience. The coming together of these elements is referred to as binding, where these different elements are integrated. And uh, uh, one hypothesis about the significance of gamma activity, and particularly the synchronized gamma activity across different regions of the brain, is that it plays a role in bringing these different elements together. So 
This is Mathieu after he came out of the scanner. I showed this picture the other day. Um, he's been in the scanner many, many times. And we have used the scanner to tell us what circuits may be uh, affected by compassion meditation practice. And here there is uh, a diagram of the brain and the area that's circled is an area that is called the insula. And the insula is a very interesting part of the brain because it's the only part of the brain that actually has a map of the different visceral organs of the body. And uh, it is a system in the brain through which interaction with the body appears to occur. And what we see in response to the negative sounds that we present to the practitioners is that the the activity in this area of the insula is dramatically enhanced during the compassion practice uh, uh, compared to a neutral state. Among novice practitioners who were taught the same practice and who practiced for one week before coming into the laboratory, there is no difference. I'd like to now uh, share with you uh, and the audience uh, findings from a very recent study uh, where we are evaluating the nature of awareness during open presence. And um, this is a particular kind of meditation practice in the Buddhist tradition. And one of the expectations, a big response, but then it comes right back down to baseline but there's very little anticipation. So, so this to, uh, so uh, I'd like to now move on, uh, mindful of time, I'm just going to go right ahead and talk a little bit about how we have considered the project of neurophenomenology and begun to explore it in the laboratory with the expert practitioners. And the motivation for this is that expert practitioners, because they are more familiar with their own mind, their reports of their experience should be more closely tied to what we actually can measure in the brain, compared to a novice practitioner who has spent much less time uh, contemplating the, 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 their mind, uh, the reports that we get there, we wouldn't expect to be strongly associated with the brain. So that's what we tested here. So the way we did it uh, is to have practitioners report on the clarity of their experience. And they are meditating, and while they're meditating, as their clarity begins to change, they... Uh, uh, press a keypad to indicate the extent of their clarity on a one to nine point scale. So if their clarity is very low, so if their clarity is low, they might rate it a one, and then it can go up the scale. 
And this is one uh, expert practitioner. And what this shows, Your Holiness, is um, on one scale is their report of clarity, and that's in the red line. And the blue line is the extent of these gamma oscillations that we talked about earlier. And this is showing the correspondence between their reports of clarity and the magnitude of these gamma oscillations uh, from the beginning to the end of a meditation period. And what this shows is a very close association between their reports of clarity and these gamma oscillations. And um, it, it, this is not true for just a single practitioner, but it happens in um, all of the practitioners that we have observed. So this is another practitioner at different points in time, and this is showing also very strong associations. And um, this is just a representation of nine practitioners, and what it is showing is the association, the, the strength of the correspondence between the reports of clarity and the magnitude of these gamma oscillations, which are depicted in blue, for each of the nine practitioners, and for some practitioners, we had different sessions, different days that they were meditating. And so that's depicted here. And across these eight practitioners, nine practitioners, uh, there is overall a very close association between their reports of their experience and the um, magnitude of gamma oscillations. In the novice practitioners, they are, the, the, the average correlation is zero. They're just not associated whatsoever. Uh, and the that we had of this practice is that there should be, um, uh, uh, if we present a stimulus to a practitioner that tells the practitioner that in 10 seconds, they will receive a very painful, physically painful stimulus. And the pain that we use is heat. And we can deliver it in a very safe way. Uh, and we give each person an experience of the heat before we start so that they know exactly what it feels like. And we tell them that when they get this cue, in 10 seconds, they'll get a very, very painful stimulus. And we conjectured that during open presence, since one moment of awareness is going to have less impact on the next, so that each moment would just be, uh, uh, would be experienced without influence of one moment to the next, that there should be a difference in the anticipation of the pain. And so in the next slide, uh, we first show the ratings uh, of the intensity and the unpleasantness of the pain. And in the um, bars that are marked OP, that stands for open presence. And what we can see is that the unpleasantness uh, in the experts, which, who are in the red, is dramatically reduced compared to the novices who are displayed in the blue. Uh, there's relatively little difference in intensity, but there's a very large difference in unpleasantness. So we now go to the brain to see what is happening in the brain when we present a cue that indicates that a pain will be occurring in a few seconds. And so this is the way the experiment works. Uh, the practitioner begins meditation, and then the stimulus begins to get warm. And they're told that once it gets warm, in 10 seconds, it will get very, very hot and painful. And so uh, the warm stimulus occurs at time zero, and then the heat occurs uh, 10 seconds later. So the question is, what is going on in the brain as well as in the body when the practitioner gets the cue which informs him that the pain will be occurring soon. And what we see here is the period uh, during anticipation as well as during the pain itself. So uh, the, um, the red bar here is the 
practitioner, uh, and the blue bar are the controls who uh, are the novices, who are just learning the practice. And uh, the period just prior to the uh, red line uh, that begins at about 10 seconds in time is when the painful heat occurs. And what we see is that in the anticipation period, before the heat occurs, the blue bar, which is the novices, begins to activate. Uh, and it shows very, very high levels of activation just when the cue is presented, even though there's no pain. So the emotional areas of the brain that are responsive to the uh, negative emotions that are associated with pain begin to show strong activation, uh, even though there's no pain at all. So this is during the period During the pain, it. So they're saying that it's a bit like they're more anxious. Yes, they're more anxious. So it's what we would say is that it's anticipatory. But already informed. They were already informed that. Oh. Yes, they're the already impact. informed. And what we would say is that it's anticipatory anxiety. It's anxiety in anticipation. And it, it serves no useful function. Uh, uh, and what we see in the practitioners who are displayed in red is that when the pain actually occurs, there's a very... Uh, Your Holiness and uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our continuance of the discussion we started this morning. It, uh, although we're going to continue with a slightly different accent and focus, uh, this morning we uh, heard about the larger uh, philosophical world in which uh, practice occurs and what the implications are in an interface with science uh, for forming a, a community of practice in contemplative neuroscience particularly. We're now going to get... Uh, hello? Yes, we're now going to get very concrete and look at a case in point of how you actually do this. How can you operationalize this? What, what kinds of hypotheses can you generate? What issues, methodological issues, do you face when uh, meditation comes into the laboratory? So uh, let me quickly uh, introduce the panel. Uh, to my far right is Rajesh Kasturagnan, who heads the cognitive science program at the National Institute of Advanced Studies at Bangalore. Uh, and uh, I, I met Rajesh, uh, when he was um, at MIT, having finished his PhD there in, in cognitive science. Uh, and I believe, Your Holiness, that you, you've met everyone else on the panel. Matthew Ricard, you know well. He translates for you in France. And for those of you who have not met Matthew, he's a monk at the Sechen Monastery in Kathmandu and also uh, holds a PhD in cellular genetics from the Pasteur Institute. Uh, Richie Davidson uh, was in our morning panel. Wolf, Dr. Wolf Singer is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research in Frankfurt and founding director of the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies and Ernst Strungman Institute for Brain Research. Uh, and uh, John Dunn teaches in the Department of Religion at Emory University, is co-director of the Encyclopedia of Contemplative Practices and the Emory Collaborative for Contemplative Studies and has his PhD in the study of religion from Harvard. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to start with Richie. I should tell you a story. Richie and I were graduate students together at Harvard. And uh, Richie, is, it was clear back then that he was going to have a brilliant career. He did, he, he did his PhD research and finished writing it up in six weeks flat. Just <laughs> to give you a normative comparison, it took me a year and a half to do the same thing. So Richie has made a great contribution uh, in founding affective neuroscience and now going on to develop the field of contemplative neuroscience. My contribution to science was to become a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with Richie. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, wonderful to be with you again, and you're such an inspiration. Uh, we are so grateful. Uh, quite a few years ago, Your Holiness, you challenged us and you said to us 
that we have used the tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities like fear and anxiety and depression. And you challenged us to apply those tools to the study of positive human qualities like kindness and compassion, equanimity. And uh, what I'd like to do in the brief time I have this afternoon uh, for the sake uh, of our panelists and also for our Indian brothers and sisters to uh, uh, give a summary of what we have learned in some of the key areas in this research program that was directly stimulated uh, by my first interaction with you uh, in 1992. Uh, and the work really began in, the, in about 1999 or 2000, and uh, it's just been accelerating since. And so I'd like to talk about four topics today. Uh, the first topic will be studies of compassion. Whoops, we can have the, uh, studies of compassion uh, uh, on the brain. And uh, here we have in advantage of the benefit of long-term practitioners that we bring to Madison uh, to uh, learn what we can about what's going on in the brain during the generation of compassion. The second... It's not, it's not on the oh. slide show. To get the... Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Can hit F5? No, that's, that's okay. Uh, so the second topic will be probing the nature of awareness during open presence. Uh, and uh, these are some very new findings from uh, long-term practitioners. The third topic is really honoring the work that Francisco Varela began, uh, and that is neurophenomenology, but neurophenomenology here with expert practitioners who are familiar with their minds in a way which we think uh, is beneficial from a neuroscientific perspective uh, to show what we can learn. Uh, and finally, the last topic will be on mindfulness and attention. So we'll see how much I can get through. Uh, so the first is on compassion. And here uh, we have done a, a very, very simple kind of experiment uh, with long-term practitioners where they come into the laboratory and we have them just alternate between a neutral state and a state in which compassion is generated. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about the specific nature of the compassion practice in just a moment. But one of the uh, uh, important qualities of working with experts is that they can produce the practice uh, and the state uh, in very short periods of time. And so this is beneficial from a scientific perspective because we can contrast the neutral state, and the meditation state. Now we also, uh, uh, as I'll show uh, in a moment, uh, we can evaluate what is happening when a practitioner generates compassion by challenging the mind with certain kinds of external stimuli that we present during the meditation state. And here, what we're particularly interested in is we present sounds of human suffering. For example, crying, uh, a woman screaming. So uh, these are sounds that challenge the mind and the brain and enable us to see how a mind which is infused with compassion responds differently from those stimuli compared to when the we're in a neutral state. And it's kind of like a cardiologist who is interested in measuring the heart will sometimes have you exercise on a treadmill to challenge the heart. And what we're doing is challenging the mind 
uh, in, a, in a certain kind of way. So in the work of Matthew here, and I'm sure he'll mention this in his presentation, he said, what we have tried to do for the sake of the experiment is to generate a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. And so, so our first study, uh, which uh, was authored by Antoine Lutz, as first author, you've met Antoine. Uh, Antoine was uh, Francisco's uh, last graduate student who is now uh, in our lab in Madison. Uh, and this is from a paper that was published in, in 2004. And uh, what it shows uh, in this figure is a transition.